we're going to take over to six o'clock. All right, we'll we'll call this meeting to order, um, and note that we do have a quorum. We are now recording. We do not have any guests, so we'll skip that. Um, agreements and norms, do we all understand the, mm -hmm. our agreements and norms that we yep. are polite people <laughs> functioning as a board? Uh, public comments and correspondence. Jody, do you have any correspondence that you've received? No? No idea. Okay, then we'll move forward to approving the agenda. Has everyone reviewed the agenda? Are there any yep. um, additions or corrections to this agenda? I move that we approve the agenda. Second. Any comments? All those in favor of approving this agenda? Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Motion passes. Let me note this here. Okay. Now, for the consent agenda, which is um, in your packet. Um, yep. Let's see. Did everyone have an opportunity to review the the packet online or in person? Okay. We have in our consent agenda we have the approval of the minutes from the 610 board meeting and we have some staffing personnel updates that were included. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Okay, good. Moved by Guy. I need a second. Second. Jana seconds. Any discussion? Jody, do you want to just briefly go through the new hires or should we just start leaving? Uh, we just have one new hire that's happened since our last meeting and that was a lab assistant so that we now have our lab assistants positions are full. And the um, young woman is Ellie Farr. Uh, she's from U32 grad back in, she actually was the COVID class 2020. Um, that we drive through there when I was there. And I didn't even uh, get to interview her, so that's, it's good that I have that connection to Dan. Um, he is going to be largely supporting our digital media arts folks. And, there, and then she has a lot Did of graphic you know, design. Jody? Excuse me? A little louder. I think it's because the AC in this room turned on. Sorry, oh. Michelle and I are joining you from JP today. Now. They're good. You're good. You're right better there. now. Um, so we just have one new lab assistant that we hired. We do have interviews coming up this week for the embedded academics humanities and for our part-time adult ed coordinator position. So our lab assistants are full and the last two positions that we have, we do have some interviews coming up. So we're really hopeful. All right, very good. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any dissent? Hearing none, motion carries. So we're through that. All right. Board reports. Um, we don't need anything on the student representative, do we? No. No. NA. No program presentation. Presentation, we don't have one this, week, this time. And the presentation regarding technical center boards by the Honorable Pietro Lin. He's going to join us at 6.15, so we can move okay. over to our committee reports and then come back to that when he joins us. Okay, very good. Yeah, it did. So we finished our, <clears throat> sorry, we finished our FY23 audit. 
Um, no significant findings. The only recommendation that we had was to reconcile some of our um, accounts monthly versus um, quarterly, um, which we started to do as of last year when our audit. All right, there's a lot of feedback, but um, our revenues exceeded the budget and our expenditures were below budget, therefore creating a surplus. Of that surplus, we did have to pay our sending schools back um, in the amount of the, or in the form of a tuition credit. Those have already gone out. They were out before during July. Um, <clears throat> so that they've, nobody has responded as far as any sending schools having any questions on that. They're more than happy to take their money back. Um, We've already started, I think I mentioned last time, we've already started our FY24 audit. The pre-audit is complete. We should have the auditors on site soon. Um, and then we're looking into FY25. Michelle, is, is there anyone that has opted to <laughs> apply the rebate to this year's? That's what we did. Uh, that's what we did automatically. We reached out to two of our largest sending schools and asked them whether they would prefer um, a tuition credit or uh, a check, and they wanted a tuition credit. So therefore, that's how we applied it uniformly across the board. So there was a tuition credit for all of our sending schools. Oh, for all? Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. Do we need a motion to approve the audit, or...? No, I think we've, um, it, it's something that we receive annually and it just, it's part of our routine activities. Um, anything special about the June, July accounts payable? Do we have a, um, um, what did it come Do we need one of those, or I think we already did though, um, the account, that we can tap into in case we don't have the resources. Uh, revenue anticipation note, do we have that? We do, we already did that. We did that at the end of last year. And so that was officially approved and that money went into our account as of July 1st. Okay. And when do they, when does the state send uh, the tuition money so that we don't have to tap into that any longer? Yeah, set of tuition usually comes in September from the state. Uh, we actually have already received a tuition check from uh, month here. So I don't anticipate we'll need to tap into that and we will be able to just leave it in the entrance. I'm wondering if we could have what is happening, how we're affected by Barry. How we're affected by Spalding's unpassed budget. We're, once our budget passes, they are legally obligated to pay our tuition rate, no matter if they have a passed or failed budget. Oh, thank you for that. Our facilities use payments and the cost of that, um, but chances are it won't go up as much as they had initially anticipated. Good. Thank you. Alrighty. Facilities committee. Any report from facilities, a project update? Yeah, so we're narrowed down to three sites. Um, we will be getting test test fits done for two sites. B32 is one site and the airport road's the other. There's, the third site is the movie property. Um, we're not gonna move forward doing a test fit just yet there because there's some um, Lease agreement with a solar array that she doesn't know if she can get out of. So we don't want to spend any more time or money mm -hmm. unless that is a you know a good point now. So mm -hmm. we're gonna move forward with the other two and we should have for the next board meeting. Great. Kind of like a, a test that means they're gonna put the paper kind of where the building would look and go on the piece of property so we can visually see that's exciting that fit, you know, and now we'll get to that. So yeah, it's moving along. Um, anything to add, Jody? Like, I think sometimes people want to see um, pieces, and so that last uh, packet 
included the initial drawings that um, La Valley Brensinger had done. So it had some of the shop spaces they had previously designed with their notes for updates. And then it has some brand new spaces that they hadn't designed before. So those are all available in that program quality packet. And then um, on there's a link on their agenda. So folks can go look at that. Um, and then later, we still have that vision statement that we want to approve moving forward down in our um, board discussion and action items. Sounds good, yeah. mm -hmm. So, Jody, in your new position, congratulations, by the way. Will facilities be a discussion uh, item during the year? Um, it will be some as far as how do we work with the legislature to decide what's going to happen. Um, and I'm wondering about this, the, the sound that we're getting from you guys. If any of you are close to that computer, if there's a way to mute and then unmute when we talk, if that'll make a difference. Because when one of you is talking, we don't get the feedback. When no one is talking, we get the feedback. Run upstairs, run upstairs and, and do that if needed. Awesome. I think we have one more committee and then we and the ICPA draws on, so we'll be able to do that. Oh, that's so much better. <laughs> Thank you. The hard part is every time Alice wants to facilitate, we need to make sure that we can hear her. We'll go forward with program quality um, and what we discussed. Let me get my notes out here. All right. Um, the, uh, design and Travis later. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, we'll talk about uh, parent engagement um, from the program. You guys want to chime in on that? No. <laughs> Um, you know, we just want to make sure that we have the information to communicate with parents and students directly, and we would like the sending schools to uh, share that information with us so that if so that we can have more, you know, greater communication with parents and students. Um, you know, we. We think that we have a process that allows, you know, families to know, you know, when students come, when they come to open house, what the different components are of the admission process. And we're still doing our comprehensive local assessment work to um, identify issues that come up with families, um, given what the information we got last year. Um, we're going to work hopefully with our boards directly um, so that when there's the Career Center open house, we, our, our boards know again that we want emails for communication. Um, I don't know, was it? Yeah, yep. so, can I jump in? Yep, yeah, right please. So, so our situation is that some schools uh, we get student emails, some schools we get parent emails, some schools allowed us to set up a, a booth at open house, some right. didn't, and we're kind of hoping that through the boards, to the superintendents, to the principals, that we can try and standardize how we reach the students in all of the schools the most efficiently we can, and, the, and their parents as well. So we're calling on everybody to, when you go back to your boards and you're doing your uh, presentation, to ask that we get this information and that we can be a part of the yeah. open house and those types of things. Right. We want a place at the table. We want a table. We want a spot. Right. So that we can publicize ourselves. The second part of it is that the local boards need to communicate to their administration 
that students who are applying to the Career Center need to be able to do the work in at the Career Center. They need to be able to read, they need to be able to compute, and, and we're looking at how they actually work on communication, both written and oral, so that they're able to move forward if they want to run their own business, if they are working with others where they need to work in teams so that they're able to do that. So that's really extremely important and that's part of the admissions packet when they look at that to make sure that even if a student is on some kind of a learning plan, they are still capable of doing the work at the Career Center. And while we would like to say that we take all comers, there are some that just cannot be in programs that we offer because of their particular needs, whatever they might be, whether they're academic, behavioral, um, emotional, whatever it might be. But, and that is all taken into consideration in the admissions process, and we need to make sure that schools under, sending schools understand that. And we realize also that it's a slippery slope because we want everyone who wants to have access, but they have to be able to access. And the last thing we talked about, you got, did you have a question on that? Or? I think I just have a, a general question based on the presentation that we had from an individual parent last mm -hmm. year. So I guess the concern at that point was that we didn't we weren't able to backfill perhaps what the IEP was if I if I remember correctly and so I think it's mm -hmm. is that the slippery slope you're talking about or the slippery slope is that somebody is denied access to the program because they're on an IEP and are we just yeah. In? yeah well but the other the other piece is do we have the the tools in motion to be able to to meet that. Right, right. That's a slippery slope. Yeah. <laughs> so the the last thing we talked about was the program presentations this year and we thought that it might be helpful for the instructors if we have uh, a checklist of three or four things that we'd like to see uh, across all of the presentations to, to help them focus in um, and so our committee is going to work on that in our next meeting but if you have any thoughts of things that you would like to see um, in those presentations if you could send them to any one of the three of us that would be great we're, we're talking about things like how do you how do you integrate the the math and, and literacy um, what do you consider to be success in your program you know, questions like that that they can come in with, with some ideas before. And additionally, if I can, yeah. um, one of the other things we talked about is what are there's what are the goals of the program that last year, for example, there was a real focus on reflective thinking and whether it was blooms or degrees of not knowledge, you know, whatever. How do you work that into your curriculum because everybody is working on the same you know the same the same goal you have a common goal so how is that manifest in within your program so that would the plan for that would be to have the program presentations be um, clear concise and to the point of, about what what it is that is being taught and involved in that program and that's just what we're trying to work toward any questions questions no all right moving on superintendent's report i'm going to back up to pietro's presentation since he is on um, and let him go before we uh, move into superintendent's report Welcome, Pietro. Well, how are you? Good. Thanks for joining us. Well, I'm very glad to be here, and it's nice to see everybody again. Um, so some of you are old friends, and other other people are new to me. Um, Jody asked me to meet with you virtually to talk about the differences between being on a CTE board and being on a what I'll call a regular school district board. 
And uh, I have um, some materials that I'd like to share with all of you. So Jody, if it's if it's okay, I'm going to um, try to do that. Great. Tell me, uh, no, I, I assumed it would be okay. How are we doing? Can you see it? Yes. All right, great. All right, so it, I, um, look, be, being on a school board is a lot that is the same as being on a, a CTE board, a CTC board, but there are some critical differences and they're contained largely in statute. Now, the starting place is to tell you, you know, whatever I may have or somebody smarter than me may have told you about the open meeting law, it still applies. Don't, don't change a thing when it comes to the open meeting law, but but there are some very interesting and fundamental differences that exist in terms of process and authority that you as a CTC board have, which is you know, really striking when compared to the folks who are, who are on a regular school board. I think the best place to start when we begin thinking about um, CTC boards, and when I say CTC, of course, I'm talking about technical centers, right? Community technical centers and CTE, I'm talking about community technical education. Or, and, and the first thing we need to understand is that um, that we, we have to provide it to all of the schools within our service region, right? We don't get to pick and choose. And one of, one of the things that I have encountered, not, not with your region, but with others, is sometimes um, there are districts that are slow to pay um, and they or they object to payment. And the question comes to me, what do we do about that district that is not paying its bills to the technical center? How do we deal with that? Do we cut off their students? And I guess what I would say to you is that's that's really not an option that um, under the statutes we have to take them. And the way we deal with anybody who is either a slow pay or a no pay is like any other commercial creditor. You know, ultimately, if they don't pay, we throw it into collections. We can file a lawsuit to get paid along with interest and attorney's fees and all of those other things that that are, you know, the parade of horribles. But the bottom line is, you know, we are a school open to all within our within our service region. And that when I say all, what I mean are students who are in comprehensive high schools. We don't, we don't take people in elementary school. We don't take very, very young students. But what we do is we take students um, without question who are in the 11th grade or 12th grade, or sometimes even as young as um, 10th grade, if it is with the support of the sending school. We also, I, I, you know, this is in a statute. I don't, I've never heard of such a thing, but it may be that there are private schools out there or schools out there that do not have grades. And if they don't, it's 16 years or older, and of course, a resident of our service region, and then we have to take them. So that's the, that's the universe of students. And think about it for a moment. This is really, in some ways, fundamentally different than, than most school boards. Most school boards, um, look, if you're, a, if you're a resident of the district, you get to go tuition free to our school. Um, but on the other hand, when we're talking about CTCs, what we're really saying is that um, there's, a, there's a small group of people who are entitled to it. The sending district is compelled to send them if they want to come, but they don't have to. And so you do not have a captive audience. You, you have an audience that may choose to turn up its nose at you. And, and what this does, I think, as I read through these statutes and tried to develop an understanding of what this all meant, is that you, you are under this rare incentive to make yourself attractive to boost your numbers. Now, maybe you don't want more numbers. Maybe you're full to the brim and you have enough. But I guess what I would say is that, um, you know, there's this sort of like this private sector incentive system for you to grow the business, if you will. And if you don't, the opposite may happen. You may shrink the business inadvertently. The, the other group um, that can come to your school if, if they want to are adults. And that's really different. 
So, so I, I, I rarely, if ever, see adults who attend uh, public high schools. It happens from time to time. But what is contemplated by the statutes when we're talking about you is uh, a, a, a phalanx, many adults attending your schools. It is, in fact, what I take from the statutory language is that is viewed as a legitimate, necessary, and, and consistent population of people who can use your expertise to, to get them in a position where they are successful in the workforce. So that, that is sort of the, the you know, like the, the beginning point of the analysis from my perspective. Now, one of the other things that you must do that looks nothing like a school district, nothing, is establish a regional advisory board. I don't, I don't know who's on your regional advisory board, and I don't know where they come from or how that was all done, but I do know what the statute requires. And the statute says that um, we, we have to have one. It, it, it says that um, the, the board will make recommendations to us, and those, those recommendations will be in writing. And, and what's interesting about the statute is that there's this presumption in the statute that these are going to be really good ideas and that if you don't follow them, there must be something wrong with you. Uh, and the reason I say that is the statute says you have to give their recommendations, and I'll throw my air quotes here, due regard. And due regard means that you got to adopt them, whatever they are, uh, within 30 days of getting them. Or in the alternative, you, you got to notify both the regional advisory board, you know, hey, here's why your recommendations are all bad and we're never going to use them. Or, or and you, you've got to tell the secretary of education, you know, sort of rat yourself out to the boss. Jody, yes. So this school board actually acts as our regional advisory board. Are you saying that we have to have two separate entities? Yes. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I am I am saying that. And the reason I say that, um, well, right, and we'll, we'll get that in a moment. But but so the regional advisory board, um, when if we're not going to do what they think we ought to do, I mean, if they don't send us recommendations, we don't have to do anything, right? We can just do whatever we want. Um, but but if they do send us recommendations, well, um, we got to we and we don't want to follow them, we got to explain why. We've got to tell the board and we've got to tell the secretary of education. And of course, as I said before, everybody we're going to talk about here today is subject to the open meeting law. So, Jody, this is why I think you cannot have the same thing, a regional advisory board and your governance board, why they can't be the same. The first reason is because the statute says that there are two different things. But the second reason is this, right? So each district high school board elects one member. Oh, okay, so that maybe looks like your group, right? Like one member. Um, but then the superintendent or their designee for each of the sending districts will be a member. And three additional members selected by the RAB um, will be voted in. Now, what's interesting is that the district boards, they, they get to determine uh, what the term is for each one of their members. I, I found that interesting. Um, so, and of course, for the superintendent or designee, that's going to change as superintendents change. Uh, and then the additional members, you know, presumably there is a thoughtful process where you select people from the community who you think are going to give you really good recommendations. And oh, by the way, those three people that you select, those three people, um, their terms can't expire all at the same time. There needs to be a continuity. So, so presumably you start off with one, two, and three year terms, and then you know the, the, the people um, cycle out. So yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know how we can satisfy the statute in this way and have it just be board members. Now, we can have a lot of board members on the RAB. I, I don't see any reason, but, but those board members have to be chosen specifically for the regional uh, board by the individual districts. Okay, any questions about that? And, and you know, like, 
what, what's interesting is that I would presume that along the way, there are going to be conversations between board, the board and, and the regional advisory board that we're going to, you know, we're going to collaborate. This isn't us working at loggerheads. You know, this is us sharing knowledge, but tasking ultimately the regional advisory board, which parenthetically could be comprised of many, many board members or governance board members. But, but that will come up with a document that makes sense for us. So we don't within 30 days have to adopt it or explain to the Secretary of Education why we're not. Okay, so what, what does the governance board do? Like, what, what is your job? And you know, it's a little bit like the uh, school district board. There's a laundry list of things that you're supposed to do. Yeah, somebody, somebody, do you have a question here? He's, he's got us muted. Okay. Oh, Go ahead. I just have a question. Oh, so, question. Okay, so our board invites our superintendent, our principals. They are invited to every one of our meetings, but not once has anyone ever showed up. So I'm wondering how we're going to get these people to participate in a RAP. Awesome question. So look, I, I, there, there's nothing in the statutes that creates a penalty if your superintendent or designees don't show up. I mean, there's no, you know, there's no CTC police that come and put them in jail if they don't come to these meetings. But I, I do enough work with superintendents where I know that if we said to them, look, we have this thing called a regional advisory board. And if you care about your students, and I think you do, either you or someone you trust will come to these meetings of the RAB and help us develop recommendations for the board. And, and, and of course, those, you know, those invitations come from the RAB, right? Like we're having a meeting. You are a member of the RAB, whether you like it or not and your designee needs to show up. And if they, you know, like if they blow it off, we can shame them into coming. But again, there's no stick we can use to actually, you know, sort of force them to come if they refuse. Does that, and, and let me be very clear about this. Um, if I were doing order of operations on that issue, the first thing I would do would be to send a letter to the supers that said, hey, guess what? We're, we're forming our regional advisory board as required by statute. You are a member of that board. The purpose of the board is to develop uh, recommendations. It is important for you or a designee to be there. And then we, we set a meeting, right, of the RAB, where we meet. And by the way, we also select our three other people to be on the RAB who are neither right selected by the school boards nor select not or nor the superintendent of schools. And if they won't come, they won't come and we'll make decisions without them. But I I, I would not make it easy. <laughs> I would tell them that it is super important for them to be there if they want to if they want a voice in what their students are going to be doing and what technical education looks like in our center. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, but it, it, I don't have a silver bullet for you. I, I can't cure apathy if it exists, but I think there are ways to, to shame people into coming or, or at least to encourage people to be designated for the superintendent to come. Because I do know this. I think there are people who populate central office or the buildings in what I'll call traditional school districts who genuinely care about technical education and what their what their students experience when they come to to Jody's home. Is okay. there any is yeah, there any is there any defined um, meeting schedule? Does it have to be quarterly? Can it be twice a year? What, what, good question. Yes. What's, yes, it can be anything, right? That's that's you know there's no required number of meetings it doesn't have to be every month for 12 months a year you know what it could be is every year the rab will sit down 
and evaluate whether it wishes to make recommendations. And if so, it will, it will create a process where those recommendations are generated in open meetings, a document is drafted, and then the document is given to the board. So they need then to have all of our meeting minutes so that they know what's been going on, it would seem. Who is they? The members of the, the review board. Well, the, the club, I mean, look, the, I, if, if I were creating the minutes for the, for the RAB, I, I would provide the minutes to all the same people that I provide the minutes to a governance board meeting to, right? So, so that's why I need mean, the governance board to the RAB so that they know when they're having discussion what it is we've been doing. Well, I, I would be unsurprised if there was some overlap where there were some governance board members who are on the RAB. But if not, yeah, I think it's a matter of good governance. It makes all kinds of sense to alert the, the governance board what you're up to. And, you know, like if they don't like it, they can come to one of your meetings and tell you why. Yep. Question? Uh, one more question. So. The number of people that are on this board will be the superintendents from all of our sending schools or their designee, three people from the business community, and then however many people we decide from our board. And is that the whole wrap? Okay, almost perfect. The, the one difference is this. The statute contemplates that it will be one member from each district and that one member will be selected not by you, but by the district board. Aren't we the district board? No, no, the high school board. Oh, I, I Yeah, and, and that's why I think there's a high likelihood they'd say, oh, no. You're like, you, you do it all, right? I mean, that would be unsurprising to me. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So um, what, what, do you, what, is the, what does the governance board do? We, we talked a little bit about the RAB. And of course, the RAB is this weird thing that doesn't exist for regular schools. And we can have a, we can have a debate about whether it'd be a good idea if they did. I mean, maybe it would be a good idea, but you're saddled with it, whether you like it or not. And I, I think in part, the reason the legislature decided to require it for you is because of the nature of the work that you do, right? Like there's this sense that the more community involvement that we have, the more um, business slash labor involvement that we have, the better the program will be in achieving the goals that we've set for ourselves. And, you know, if we create this advisory board that is that is populated by people who know education, superintendents and designees, and people who know their communities, people selected by the boards, and, and people from the community, business people or, or labor leaders or whatever, that, that you know, the combination of these will create a magical elixir that will result in awesome recommendations. So, so what do you do as a governance board, right? So we, um, it, this looks, you know, frankly, a lot like regular school boards. Um, we establish admission and program completion policies. And I guess that's the part that's a lot different than your local boards. We, we don't have admissions policies. It's not something we do. But if you're if you are a, a CTC board, that is one of the things that not only can you but must do. And, and what that looks like, you know, it's funny, I was listening to the conversation before I came on and there was a, you know, discussion about, you know, whether students are capable of successfully completing the program. Um, this is not a decision that should ever be made on an ad hoc basis. We should always have a document that says these are the criteria we use to determine whether you can enter into any particular program. Of course, one of them that comes to mind is safety, right? There, you know, there's some students who have um, who have disabilities where working with power tools might not be totally appropriate. And so we, we need to think about what that looks like across a broad domain 
of various kinds of technical education, right? Like what, what a student who can successfully complete a childcare program uh, may have all kinds of difficulties when it came, comes to a construction trades program. So just something to think about in your policy. And Jody, I hesitate to ask, but am I like beating a dead horse? You all have done this six ways to Sunday and all right, never mind. Um, the, the, the other thing is you got to evaluate your success. I, I think that might be the second most important thing you do. You know, what? it's one thing to establish what you're going to do, but it's really quite another to figure out whether what you've done actually makes a positive difference, whether what you are doing um, achieves the goals that you and the state of Vermont have set for you. Um, another thing you do is you offer programs so that prospective students get to know who you are. And it might be short, you know, short course of study just to give them a flavor for it. It might be visits, um, but they're the kinds of things where you don't have to enroll. They are, they are programs where people become acquainted with the good work that you're doing and causes them to think, aha, this is, this is the thing for me. Um, you as a board have to, and, and this isn't on Jody, this is on you as a board, believe it or not, by statute. Uh, and then the other thing is you have to, after thinking about efficient and cost-effective use of the center, establish fees for building and equipment use. All right, wh wh why do I care? Why do you care about that? Um, because it presumes that, that people are going to be using your equipment and your building. It is, um, you know, like it scares me to think that we're gonna allow people to come in and use our equipment, but that's what the statute says. And, you know, like your job is to figure out um, what, what's it gonna cost? You know, what are we gonna charge to use the, the router? Um, that, you know, obviously we're hoping that Jody comes up with some recommendations for that. I, I presume she would, but in the end, your job is to parse and figure out whether it's the right number with these factors of efficiency and cost effectiveness in mind. Um, and you establish your tuition. You knew that because you, you already do it. Um, I, I, I love this slide because it's not just from the statute. And it's, this is my bias. You know, I spent a lot of time with boards. I, I look at my friend, Jason, he knows I bored him before. Um, my, my, look, my, my bias here is, is for boards to, you know, roll up their sleeves and, and figure out if what we're doing works. And, I, I, you know, how do we get there? And, and what are the systems that we put in place to figure that out? And, you know, I presume that they're metrics, right? Like we have some way of actually measuring beyond um, somebody saying, yeah, it was a great program. I had a great time. Thank you. I feel like I learned a lot. Um, and and I, I would encourage something that allows you to follow students after they have graduated in a way that, you know, allows you to definitively understand if you are achieving your goals in terms of taking this technical education and turning it into something more than an academic exercise. Um, and, and your communities may have their own vision of what success looks like and I, I encourage, you know, again, I consider this maybe the second, maybe the first most important thing that you do. And, and, that, and, and leaving it to Jody alone is both not consistent with the statute and frankly, not fair. You know, like your job is wraparound here and to, to, to develop an understanding from your communities, uh, uh, you know, maybe from your local boards, maybe from people you meet, maybe from people in the business community, maybe people in the public sector. You know, what is a successful outcome? What are we, what are we do? What are these students doing when they emerge fully formed from your program? And is it a value add? Um, do we follow up with employers and former students? You know, who, who does that work in our, in our organization? All of those things I think are contemplated by the statute, not for Jody, but for you.
Now, obviously, you know, like you're this is a this is not a you know full time job for all of you. It it is a you know maybe one and a half full time job for Jody. Uh, so so it would not be unwise for you to delegate the work to the people who are in the administration, um, or or to hire a consultant potentially to help you with that work. But the bottom or or to put the rab on it, right? That's something the rab could do. But but the bottom line is this: is that at least at least under the statutes, this this is your baby. This is your responsibility to make sure that this is done. And if you don't, you are not fulfilling that statutory responsibility. Now, there's no negative consequence, nothing bad happens, but you have to go to bed at night knowing you didn't quite do everything you should have done. Um, ah, facilities and equipment use, right? When I, when I hear that, as a lawyer, I cringe, right? The concept of us saying to people, oh yeah, you can come use our equipment. Like I just got visions of liability issues just dance in my head. Um, so so what are the factors that you as a board should consider as you work your way through facilities and equipment use? Um, first of all, the constitutional issue. We are all really eager to let people who have political views or no political views, but political views we agree with or no views at all, community groups to use our facilities. But one of the things we need to understand when we develop policies around use of our facilities is that we don't get to decide winners or losers on the basis of whose speech we like and whose we do not. And so if we are going to establish policies around the use of our stuff, um, then we need to understand that that the, the policy itself must be content neutral, right? So we can't restrict it to just some people. If we're gonna let some people use it, then we go let everybody who fits those criteria that have nothing to do with speech use the, the facilities and the equipment. And then when we apply that policy, we've got to do it in a content neutral way. So, so oftentimes um, we, we find ourselves in a situation where we as a, as a board have to be very careful about what that policy looks like to make sure that when somebody wants to use, for example, our premises, our facilities, that you know, we're okay with it, um, you know, taking on all comers. And, and the example is this, I don't know how many of you um, read about the situation at Addison Northwest for Jen's high school. For Jen's high school had the VSBA facilities use policy, which says essentially, you know, everybody, as long as they get insurance can use our facilities because we love our community and lo they love us. And they, everybody was happy about it in that community until um, one family said, we're going to organize something where a speaker is going to come. And that speaker is virulently anti-trans and um, you're gonna have to put up with it. And the question of course, at that time was, do we have to put up with it? And the answer is, of course, this is America. We, we, we do not censor people based on their political views. Now, if we as a board decide nobody's gonna use our, our facilities, well, you know, that, that's a different thing. Then we can say no to them, but we have to say no if, it, you know, if we have a gym, we have to say no to uh, the men's league basketball liability issues. Well, I, I don't have to spend a lot of time talking about liability issues, but I just would say this, it's really easy to get hurt with power tools. And, um, you know, we need to be very careful about what we charge, which tools we let people use, um, what, what we get in terms of uh, releases and authorizations from people who want to use our facilities, what level of supervision they expect and what level of supervision we will give who pays for any damage to the equipment during the time that they're using it. You know, these are all issues that um, we need to consider. Um, and then finally, we got to make sure that uh, everybody who comes is insured uh, so that if there is some incident, they can be sued and their insurance will respond. And oh, by the way, their insurance ought to name us as an insured also, so our insurance doesn't have to pay if we both get sued, the user and us. All right, 
So what else do you do? Um, well, we, we know this, that you, uh, you determine educational policies. Um, they need to be in writing and codified and made available to the public. I, I think you do that. Um, we, we give notice of our intent to adopt policies and we, you know, we allow them people to come to public meetings to comment on them. We debate them internally and we make sure that they're consistent with our views because of course, boards engage in policy governance, which means that, you know, we as a board, our job is to, you know, I, I, I often think of um, a cruise ship, right? The, the board the board sets the itinerary. We're gonna go to Rome one day, and then we're gonna go to Sicily the next. How fast we go, what route we take, who's driving the boat, uh, what gets served for dinner. You know, those are all things that Jody gets to decide. That's the administration's day-to-day -day responsibility. But you as the board set the big picture. You're like, where are we going? What are the goals? How how we're going to get there uh, broadly, but the, the operational day-to-day -day details are left to the administration. Um, but that looks a lot like a regular school board. Um, and, and this also looks like a, a regular school board. And that is, you know, we, we do everything that's necessary to make sure that the, the CTC uh, operates the way it should. And, and what this means really in the end is that you as the board have the final say. Um, you know, we, we believe in policy governance because schools work best when that happens. But what we know is this, that, that when push comes to shove, and it rarely does, but when it does, you as a board get to decide how it's going to be. It is your choice. And if you want to make decisions unwisely about the operational details, this statute says you get to do it. And that is no different than any other school board in the state of Vermont. Oh, and the other part uh, is that you are responsible for the property, right? You are the ones who ultimately, the buck stops on your desk to make sure that, that the property is managed the way you want it to be, the way it ought to be. You know, questions of deferred maintenance, those are all your questions to grapple with. Building a new building, those are your questions. Um, now, I, I said deferred maintenance, those are your choices, but I'd also say this, that the bias that exists in the statutes is that you won't, is that you will keep things in good repair, that they will be suitable and safe, um, and that you will do the things necessary to make the school, make the CTC a place where people can safely and comfortably uh, do the work they need to do. Um, we have to have a, a firearms policy, just like all other schools, that's important. But you know what, one of the things that I often um, think about as I drift off to sleep at night is, is what, what is the interplay between a CTC board and a district sending board when it comes to student discipline? Who's in charge? Where does it go? Who decides? Um, yeah, this is really challenging, isn't it? Um, whose decision is, is it to expel a student? And of course, the answer is yours. If you want to expel a student, if you must, uh, under Vermont statutes or your policies, that is up to you. If you want to suspend a student, you may. And how that plays out at the local school board level, when the student goes back to wherever they came from, you know, back to Barry or um, whatever, whatever other sending town, well, that that you know that that is their burden to carry. But all you need to do is worry about how do we handle this student's participation in our program, and what happens somewhere else is between them and their sending board and that superintendent. Um, this one, this statutory authority, I won't call it a duty, I'll call it an authority, is a little bit different than school boards. No, wait, my slide says it's very different. It is. You get to decide whether you lease or purchase real estate, personal property, you sell it, relocate, you know, like it's all up to you. And as you know, regular boards from whence you came um, that if it's going to be at least greater than three years or the purchase or sale of property, that all must be decided by the electorate. You as a board don't have the authority at the district level 
to make those decisions. You as a CTC board, you know, like you have greater authority and can make those decisions, which is fascinating because when we think of, we'll get to it in a minute, when we think of the, the mechanism, the process by which we adopt budgets as compared to, you know, other districts and, you know, how that all works out, it's an amazing authority. You know, once they're in your, your CTC and your service region, uh, you, your budget can be unlimited, a gazillion dollars, and they have to swallow it. And that's amazing, right? There are very few places in education where one board can decide, at least in part, the budget for another, and you can. All right. You have to establish financial controls. And look, I, I you know, like I, I, I know boards don't really do this. I know that boards rely on administrations and accountants and auditors to do this work. Um, but I, you know, like I would strongly encourage us to make sure that we stick our noses in every once in a while to make sure we know how this all goes. You know, what are the systems in place and are they safe? Are they consistent with expectations in our communities for the spending of hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars? Uh, and, and that doesn't mean you have to do anything, but it does mean you need to know. And so I would strongly encourage you once a year to have somebody, whether it's Jody or whether it's your auditors, come forward and talk to you about what those are and why they're okay and satisfy yourself that you are comfortable with the way that your finances are being controlled internally, that you are not vulnerable to embezzlement. Okay, and here's some other, you know, we talked about a laundry list of things here, you know, like there's this list in your statutes that tell you what it is that, that uh, the governance board does. Um, you have an assistant, a system of accounts for the proper control and reporting of finances. Um, we get to sue, you as a board get to decide if you sue or not sue, right? Like that, that's fun, I like that. Um, you execute contracts on behalf of the center, including contracts providing for binding arbitration. Um, the chair or anyone designated by the board gets to do that. You employ persons to do the work. So that means boards hire and boards fire. Um, you, you provide at the expense of the center, subject to the approval of the director or superintendent, all the textbooks, learning materials, equipment, supplies. You get the audit every year. You establish policies and procedures to avoid an appearance of board member conflict of interest. Now, hold on a second. Now, some of you have had to tolerate me when I'm doing my open meeting law or board roles and responsibility training and heard me say, what is an appearance of, of uh, conflict of interest? Not a conflict of interest. It is an appearance and just that. And, and we don't have to worry about it, but we do on the CTC board. And I asked myself, again, these are questions that, that school lawyers ask themselves and nobody else. Why, why did the legislature include this concept of even an appearance, even an appearance of a conflict of interest? And I think the answer is because the nature of the work that you do, the nature of the work of CTCs, that that they're, you know, we we work with employers, we hire people from our communities, our business communities. I think there is a sense that we would be more subject to this appearance of impropriety. Now, that doesn't mean an appearance alone is enough to disqualify us. It isn't, and we can talk about that in a moment if you like. We we only get disqualified when there is an actual conflict of interest. An appearance of a conflict of interest just means that what we need to do when it appears we have that is we need to explain to the board in full what it is, why we don't have it, and why this is not an actual conflict of interest and why we consider it appropriate for us as a board member to vote on some, participate in the, the debate and, and then in the vote on any particular issue. Okay, I'm almost done with what you do. Um, forgive me, it's taken longer than you wanted, but, but this is the other thing you do. You borrow money by issuing bonds. 
you apply for grants and get grants. So I think that means that you as boards need to, you're the ones who need to apply for that is vote in favor of the application and you must sign it and you must sign the grant. Um, you provide informational materials to the electorate, right? Um, and, and, and those materials must be reasonably designed to inform, educate, and explain what it is you're asking them to vote on in terms of finances. And believe it or not, that is different than a normal board. In theory, a normal board could be silent and they could just send to the electorate their vote and say here, their budget and say, here it is, vote up or down without explanation. And that would be sufficient, not you. Okay, so what about these sending districts? What do they have to do? Well, they, they got to give students the opportunity to come, right? They can't, you know, like if you're some tiny little school and you can't afford to lose any more students, you can't, you can't cover their eyes and their ears and say, you don't get to go to the CTC, right? Like, you know, even the smallest of schools has to allow students to go. And not just that, they have to get them there which is very different than most school boards. You know, most school boards, traditional schools, there's no duty to transport. The only reason we must is because we want to. But for CTCs, there is a duty to transport. Um, and, and then sometimes we send our students to different non-service region CTCs. And that's because they have a program that is unique, um, something that, that is different than in our service area. And so if we as a CTC are looking to be, you know, like poaching in other service regions, one of the things we can do is create programs that nobody else has, or at least nobody in other service regions near us, right? Like, oh, in Randolph, they don't have this special thing. So kids from that service region might come to us. Oh, and the other thing that the schools need to do, whether they like it or not, is they got to give you the names of kids who um, might come to your CTC and you get an opportunity to recruit them. Oh, and by the way, your marketers, right? The, the, the state of Vermont, when they passed these statutes, really thought that you'd be out there beating the bushes for students, you know, telling them how great you are. And so you get to get their names whenever you want them. You, um, you get to establish programs that don't require enrollments, like little tastes of what it would be like. And they'll come away going, wow, it was so great. I definitely want to go there. Um, the districts have to pay. They, they can't say, no, no, you know, that's 70% of our kids. We're not doing it. Or that's too many. That's 10 kids this year. Instead of five last year, you're going to blow our budget. They don't, they don't get a choice. Um, and then you get to market to adult students. Now, you, you can't collect as much from these adult students. I think the number was 40% of what you charge in general tuition. But if that is of interest to you, there's nothing to prevent you from, you know, like digital marketing. Hey, adults, if you want to learn how to be a machine tool operator, we're the place for you. You got to come here and look at our success rate in placing people in jobs when they finish. So, so really, um, it is contemplated that you will do something more than just, you know, shrug and say, here we are. It's contemplated that, that, you know, like you will get out there and beat those bushes. All right, special budget rules. Um, we go to an annual meeting and we estimate um, the expenses for the next year. Uh, and then we, you know, we try and appropriate the money necessary for the next year. And if it's wrong, like if it's not enough, then, you know, we can collect it next year. And, um, and that goes up for a vote. But, but the thing that always captures my interest when I think of the CTCs is this concept that once your budget is set, it gets divided by each sending district. You send out a bill and they shall pay. Not, not if they want to, not if they agree, they will pay. So it is an incredible authority, an incredible power that you have to 
set your tuition and collect the funds to pay for it, no matter what people think. Um, so, so we don't need to talk about a conflict of interest just to say this, that, you know, conflicts of interest are about, about personal matters um, where your private interests, not, not your interests as a member of the public or a member of the board, you know, a very private thing. And so, you know, I often hear this concept of, well, you know, you have a very strong opinion already. You haven't given it a choice and therefore it's a conflict of interest. That's not true. It needs to be something like um, you as a board member stand to financially gain. A member of your family stands to financially gain or lose. And those are the kinds of things that are meant by a conflict of interest. And appearance, we talked about that a moment, a moment ago. And, and the last thing I would say, and, and it, I just, you know, this is not CTC specific, but I just want, I always say it anyway when I'm talking with board members. Um, you have way more apparent authority. People think you are more powerful than maybe you actually are. And so when you're interacting with employees in the, in the district or in the CTC, I think it's really important for you to identify who you are and in what capacity you're acting. So if you have a student um, who is in the, in the CTC, I think it's really important for you to say, I am now acting as a parent not as a board member. And, it, and these roles and responsibilities sometimes get blurred. And I, I, I just, I think it's super important for us to remember that and at all times identify both to ourselves and to the people with whom we're interacting so that there, there isn't confusion around that, in, in, that issue. Um, the last thing that, that you need to do is, the, and this is probably the most important thing you need to do is, is manage Jody, right? To, to evaluate her, to, um, come up with metrics in, in conversation with her, in conjunction with and in collaboration with uh, the goals that you have set for the CTC to, to, to determine whether she's doing the work the way you want it done. And part of that is really clear communications around expectations in advance, in writing and in advance. No surprises, right? Like I, the worst thing in the world is for us as a board to sit down and, with Jody and say, hey, Jody, um, you know, like I have a good feeling about you today. So nice job. See you next year. Uh, no, the best thing to do is for Jody to have a document that is written that says these are your goals with metrics. This is how we will know that you're doing a good job. And, and these are, you know, these are the things that we're going to be looking at in six months or nine months or a year, uh, making sure that they're reasonable, making sure that those that that document was was done in collaboration with Jody. And then, you know, and then what, once you've done that, collecting data and making sound decisions around performance. Okay, so that was what I think I was gonna say to all of you, and I'm sorry, I, I kind of went on, but if there's anything, any questions, I'm, I'm super glad to respond. Are you going to send the slides to Jody? I can, if you would like me to. Jody, what did I miss? Um, I don't think that I'm remembering. I feel like this RAB piece was not in the first one. <laughs> um, we, I already have a quick goal to work on, clearly. Um, but I feel like everything else that you hit on was exactly what you talked about two years ago when you did this. So, was it that long, Jody? You're making me feel old. <laughs> it was that long ago, yes. All right. Well, look, everybody, I, we, we don't need to stretch this out even more. Great to kind of see you all and be with you all. Um, and I will make sure tomorrow morning to send the uh, slides to Jody. And in the meantime, if anybody has any questions or concerns, I, Jody knows how to get a hold of me. We, we do have, have some questions. We have one. All right, go for it. The legislature puts through lots of, of uh, statutes that apply to, to general education schools. What's the role of a CTE in following those statutes, such as 137 the literacy statute or the 139, 139 the, the literacy statute or um, 
the uh, quality standards for school boards. How do, do we, what's our relationship as a, as a CTE board to those? Yeah, so I guess what I would say is this, that, that the LEA has primary responsibility for those issues. Um, you know, like they, they are responsible for the, for the general ed and, and your job is to make sure that your programs are consistent with those that e either A, specifically meant, you know, the, the statutes that specifically mention you or B, um, the ones that incorporate you by reference. Do, do, if, you're, if you're offering academic programs, of course, you've got to make sure that they meet the agency's um, standards, no question. But if we're talking about, about technical education, those are unique to you. And that's the vast majority of what you do, I think. And so the, you know, your job, it, it, what, those standards aren't really directly applicable to, to the technical education. Until such time as we become a, a full day program. And, and, and so I agree with it seems to me that that's a natural outgrowth of where we are now is for you to become a full day program. And, you know, then you can better, I think, integrate the, the general um, academics with the technical education in a way that's geared towards getting students to a place where you achieve the goals that you've set for yourself. Like, I totally get that. Okay, am I dismissed? Very good. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Is he gone? <laughs> <laughs> Can you now tell lawyer jokes? <laughs> ay, ay, ay. <laughs> Okay. All right. Um, so, sure. Madam Chair. Yes. If, so. I, if I could comment on that on the presentation, uh, having served on the new board for a little while, uh, you know we're not perfect, but I think we've done a pretty darn good job in terms of you know the issues that were you know were talked about. Number one and number two is I know people are having a reaction to the rap board, but. We're really not that far away from having, uh, we're to only two years away from having a formalized RAP board. And I think, if I remember correctly, they're still on the website. Uh, so it might just be to reformalize that, number one. Yeah. Number two is I'm gonna go back to how the program quality with the local right. districts and schools and stuff. Right. We can use the RAP board, you know, once we get it back together right. to meet some of those goals because you've got the you know the stakeholders at the table and it's another way to you know potentially you know communicate so i don't think we're that far off but maybe there's something i don't know it's good thinking it just seems like a lot yeah i believe that along the same line there's solutions that might be easier than we're suddenly considering so we can start to discuss those. All right, any other discussion on our legal counsel's presentation? Anything from those at home on our legal counsel's presentation? All right, hearing none, we'll move forward. Uh, we're up to the superintendent's report. Okay, so you, you, you saw in the August piece, the only photos that I included were um, of the new welding space and some of the work that's happening in there, just to let you know it is happening. Uh, you probably saw that when you looked at the funds being spent. Uh, the last two months is a large amount went to them and some's going to Truex Cullens, of course, for the work that we're doing for facilities. So those are our biggest expenditures um, so far. I, I decided to go all the way kind of back to June because we hadn't had a meeting since June 12th. So. I included the video from the end of year awards. I know it was in our newsletter, but I thought in case anyone missed it. Um, our Skills USA winners did go to Atlanta and they did not win, or they didn't medal there, 
Um, but they did have a great time and I know that they learned a lot and they enjoyed the experience and got a lot out of it. Um, several of our folks, six of us total, went to the Schools That Work conference in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I can tell you that's a tough place to go to a conference because if you've never been, um, because there are so many things that you want to check out in Nashville, plus so many things at that amazing conference to check out. And so we had a lot of decisions to make. And I think everyone really enjoyed the conference, attended at least more than the minimum um, to get their certificate and have a lot to share with their colleagues when they came back. So there were um, four instructors that went and myself and um, the assistant director. So it was a really great experience. It was great to have so many folks there. Um, last the previous year, we only had two of us go. So it was it was good to have a larger cohort go and we could spread out and learn a lot more that way because we could attend more pieces of it. We also hosted the um, Vermont Works for Women Rosie's Girls welding camp here um, this summer and we did not charge a fee. I know that was something that we had expressed concerns about in the past um, that they chose not to come to us uh, last summer because of our fees. And for us, we weren't getting data as to whether or not students from that program were coming into our center. Now that we have a welding program, it made sense to um, host them and in the future to host them in our welding space once that's built um, so that we can actually see the correlation between those summer camps that they provide and whether or not those students end up applying to us and coming. Um, so we did host that at no charge to them this summer. Our mobile home project, we did get one bid on that. And um, that bid was from someone who's coming from out of state, moving to Vermont, is a welder too. Um, and they are moving to our region. So they're moving into Middlesex. Um, they made a the only bid on it, it, which was more than our minimum. And we did get through all of the red tape that came out of the agency and we got the title from the governor's office. And so we're able to move forward on that and that should be moving off our site on August 22nd. So we look forward to seeing how that goes. And, and the wonderful opportunity with this is that that individual has um, volunteered at CTE programs in the state they're coming from and now they're willing to and hopeful to volunteer in our program. So we, we got somebody who is buying that trailer from us and they're going to be supporting us in the future and a new person to Vermont. So three wins, I think, in that one. Uh, let's see. I think the other exciting thing is Michelle and I are joining you from Jay Peak where the Vermont CTE conference is taking place um, today and tomorrow. And as Guy alluded to at the beginning, I am now the Vermont Association of CTE Directors president. And that transition happened this morning as part of the meeting here. Thanks, Stephanie, and everyone else who's, who's saying that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, that's been a really exciting. It's great to be up here, although it's hard to virtually join a meeting and it's also good practice to see what it's like for those of you that do join virtually. Um, it helped us understand that feedback piece. And uh, we're, we're learning some great things. I have a couple of my instructors up here and much of the office staff will be joining us tomorrow for that. And it's just been great to, to kind of interact with our peers in CTE across the state and to have the governor came up this morning, the interim secretary is here, um, and lots of folks just being able to share their knowledge with us and for us to bring back to our centers. So it's, it's good to be a part of that. This is the second conference since COVID. They used to have what was called the Take the Helm conference um, way before. And that kind of shut down probably in 2012, actually long before COVID and nothing happened for a long time. And so we've brought it back and it's a great opportunity in the summer for us to gather and kick off and then next week teachers are back in the building. So excited for that on Monday, we have new teachers um, orientation for them. Um, and then we move right into our, our whole staff is back and then the week after students. So we're, it's, it's almost the end of August, it feels like with all that coming together, but it's exciting too. Um, thank you. Yeah, quick, quick question. Okay, Guy has a question. Uh, Jody, uh, 
you know, one of our sending schools instituting a new cell phone policy, and I'm wondering how that matches with ours. What what do we currently require right now? Last year we did a no cell phone policy, and so basically we, I, I think what Harwood is doing is they're they're buying those pouches that students have to put their um, phones in. We didn't do it that way. Sometimes it depends uh, program by program how teachers deal with that. But it's either a you can carry it on you, but it's not to be seen or heard piece or they collect them. So a lot of our um, teachers have a basically a clear plastic case that they put them in and those cell phones sit there for the program. And we agreed as a full staff that's what we wanted to do last year and, and how we would move forward with that and we let students know at our well opening welcome assembly on the first day of school we had kind of notified folks in advance in our newsletter and i think it went really well towards the end of the year there were a couple of programs where there were some issues coming back up that students were kind of using them again and we had to try to reinforce those rules but for the most part everyone agreed that it was a much better year people bonded faster um, programs were stronger because we didn't use them other sending schools also had stopped using them so u32 also did not have um, cell phones weren't allowed last year except i think in free bands or maybe lunch so though it helps when our sending schools are doing that and i think the more sending schools that do it the easier it makes it for us too that's what twinfield is doing the same thing they're not they're allowed to do it during lunch or you know before or after, but not during. And uh, right. we're about to implement. We don't know. We're investigating. I have an appointment with the school board association. They don't have sample policies. They'll talk to you about it, but they don't have a boilerplate policy to hand you and say, "Hey, consider this." Just FYI. And the new yeah, it's a new procedure. What? It's more of a procedure than a policy. They, it, no one wants to hit it that hard with a policy. I think um, our, our keynote this morning is a psychologist from uh, New Hampshire who does speak, she does this all the time. And she said, we can't multitask. And when we get distracted by our phone, so where we go and answer a message or we, we get off focus because of it, it takes up to 26 minutes to get back on focus. And so she she said, use this example that you're going, every parent has bought their kid a trumpet and gotten them some trumpet lessons and every kid brings their trumpet to school and they're playing it in school when you're trying to teach. Like that doesn't work. And so, and we're not gonna say, we're like, no trumpets, right? That's what we're saying with the cell phones, no trumpets, that's distracting our class. And in this case, the parents are like, but I, my kid deserves to have a trumpet and they should be able to play whenever they want. If you say it that way, you understand how crazy it is and how the impact it has. And, and we can think of ways that, um, for instance, when there was that incident at Montpelier High School where they had to go into lockdown and it was that, um, it wasn't even a real incident. Our students, because of their access to technology, had information like really fast and they were, they were really scared and really nervous. And it's hard to support them when we they get it before we do a lot of times and trying to mediate that and, and let them know everything's OK and get them real information and calm them down. But if they don't have access to their phones, then they don't get this. They don't get they don't bully each other as much during our time. They don't get access to things that are going to impact them. Like some parents, well, I should be able to text my kid whenever, and they want to text their kid that their dog died or something. It's horrible the impact that has on the kiddo who's trying to access a program. And so it's super helpful to not have cell phones. And and I think the more that we keep doing that in school and teaching kids that it's okay to put it aside for a while and minimize their time on those screens, the better we're going to be. The uh, New York Times had a good article today on cell phones and the different schools and the different states and what they were doing. Just, I have it if anybody wants me to send it to you. All right. Does that take care of everything, Jody? That was good. I like the trumpet. Yes. <laughs> All right. Moving forward. Um, the VSBA policy 
audit update. Um, jo oh, okay, we're uh, Jody. Do you want to handle the policy update, or how should we do that together, or what? Sure. I, I like we. Alice and I met with um, the folks from VSBA that are going to walk through our policy update with us. They're going to do it in chunks. We're going to start with the required. Um, one of the things that I learned from them and from just before this is that even if it doesn't apply to us, if it's required, it's required. So it's sort of like that RAB thing that <laughs> Pietro just told us. Um, even if we don't have a kindergarten, we're still required to have that policy that's related if it's in the policy or if we're not transporting students, um, whatever, it's still required. So we have, we're going to, I'm going to add those in to the next round. So in September, you'll see we'll have all the required policies that we don't currently have. There's a few that we had gotten rid of because they didn't apply to us. Um, what the VSBA said is they, they don't apply to us. So we're, it's, we're never going to be in the problem of not following them because they don't apply. So we're yeah. yeah. And so we're they're going to walk through all of our policies in chunks. They're going to start with require, then they're going to go to recommended, and they're going to give us feedback on any of the ones that we have that they that are just us specific to. Um, and they're going to give us commendations, recommendations, and then as a board, you'll get to decide next steps based on that. In general, it's going to take a while. It's not something that's yeah, it's that, good work, yeah, though. And, and yeah, we'll, we'll do that, and then we'll be up to speed on that. And then whatever ones we have to go forward with because of the new legislation, we'll at least have the the review behind us so we can get everything in an orderly fashion. All right, uh, school board association and uh, fall conference. Just want to put that out there that, that any of you who are interested in attending um, can. And Alice, I hope you are as our chair. And then also we need to authorize someone to be the representative for Visbit um, for that vote that happens. And I included that documentation in there, or I think it was in the packet. It's not linked here. Did we authorize you last year? No. no. Who was it? Oh, you. Okay. Well, want to do it again? No, I can't. <laughs> I mean, experience counts, right? I'm busy. <laughs> I think for the Vermont school boards, the Visbit one, it was me that you appointed, and that we appointed um, one of our members to do the VSBA piece, which we haven't gotten their recommendations yet. And it's not till October, so we can also hold on this one. Oh, okay. I didn't get yeah. right. Then moving forward to our policies, the first reading of the equity policy. Has everybody gone over that? This was a policy that we had on right. hand, and now it has been um, it has strike through. Yeah, and it has been redone because of the changes in legislation. And all that. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. We're going to shed a little light on this subject. <laughs> Also, um, Life Lideros is our Equity Scholar in Residence, and he did log in for this part. He facilitated the discussions um, with staff and, and this process for editing it. So if you have any questions, he's here to answer them as well. Okay. Model policy, or is this is this homegrown? Yeah. I'm going yeah. to say that it's uh, edits of the model policy, a homegrown okay. edits of the model policy. Great. Yep, that's good. 
do you have an equity team now, Jody? You have an equity team, don't you? Uh, there was a team of teachers who met um, with our equity scholar pretty regularly, and they may choose to continue on the team that we would have moving forward. Uh, I wanted to commend you uh, or the, the team on, on changing the language to be much more inclusive of everybody, taking out things like minimizing biases of adults towards individual students, but rather everybody towards themselves, towards each other. I, I thought that was great. Any further questions, comments, concerns? I think it should go global. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Um, so we need, um, do we need to have a second reading or can we vote on it right now? I believe you do you need a second reading just to get that 10 day piece in um, that okay. we talked about. So first reading and then the second reading we can adopt. All right, move this forward to a second reading and put it on the um, September board agenda. So do we need a motion for that? Um, I don't know. But yes, okay, we'll do, an, we'll do a motion to move this forward to a second reading. So moved. Moved by Lyman, I need a second. I'll Sorry. second. Okay. Guy second. Yeah. All those in favor of moving it forward to us, moving the equity policy forward to a second reading. Aye. 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 Anyone, Aye. Oppo anyone opposed? Hearing no opposition, motion carries and we will move the second reading to the September meeting. September 2024. All right, vision statement. That is on the um, on the last page last before page. the program of yep. studies. Any questions, concerns about the, the vision statement? Is there, give everybody an opportunity to read it. I had one question. By putting the, the date of 2029 in there, are we locking ourselves into something that could be later than 2029 or? That, that's the goal. The vision statement for the facilities is the top section. Okay. But it's just a goal. Right. right? So you gotta have, you have to have some place to shoot for it. Mm -hmm. yep. So I would say no, there's no lock in. It's okay, just, just, wanted, to just wanted to be sure that we weren't painting ourselves into a corner. That was my question. Any other questions, concerns? No concern. Just to thank Terry for the work that she yeah. did on this. Yeah, very yeah. Much. great. Good thing next year she'll be We hope so. <laughs> All right. So do we have I'm a just, just trying to rule it. I'm just <laughs> wondering, I'm just wondering <laughs> if under our vision, when we talk about ex increased academic achievement through the full day program, do we want to talk about expanding the licensure opportunities for early college or credentialing career pathways? I mean, that level of accreditation. So this vision statement is really about the project. Oh, okay. So I, I don't know that we want to go that far into the Okay, that's a weedy thing then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, the facilities vision statement. Okay, yeah. very good. Yeah, it's a vision statement that'll help us with marketing as we look forward to that new center and a potential bond vote in the 2025 year. That the RAD board will help, help us support. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'd like, I'd like, right? I'd like to Quiet. move that we, uh, <laughs> that we approve the vision statement, the facilities yes. vision statement. Okay, we have a motion to approve. We have I'll a second. second. Guy is second. Let me put this down. Lyman. Guy. Any further discussion? No, it's excellent. 
Hearing none, um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing none, motion carries. So we have adopted the vision statement for the facilities. Okay. Next on the list, um, the design and um, fabrication program. We have some information about that and it requires action. Jody, do you want to explain what's happening with design and fabrication? Sure, as all of you know, we had a, a limited number of people who applied for the program. And so we've been talking about this potential pause. And what we've learned from the Agency of Education was that to move the program forward, it needed to have a minimum of eight students in it. Um, and we needed to identify the industry recognized credentials or college credits that would be going with it. So those were the two factors for moving it forward. As we closed out the school year in June, we had three students who had been, uh, I guess, accepted pending program continuation. So we were very clear with them that it could, it might not happen if we don't have enough students. And we had one student who was in the program last year who wanted to do co-op. So that would be four total students that we could con consider in that program. Over the summer in our third round applications, we got no new applicants, unfortunately. We, we got one and then they withdrew before we could even get to our next day. So we, we do not have eight. Um, what the board did decide to do in the spring was to continue our contract with that instructor, regardless of whether the program paused or not. So they, um, Juliana, will be working to support our existing programming this year when, when students are present. And he will be doing outreach and working with our semi school um, in collaboration with our teachers to do some teaching in their programs and their classes in order to try to market the program and get interest for the future year. The agency of education requires that we as a board make the decision about pausing it and send that information in the board minutes to them. Um, and we can restart it within one calendar year with another um, discussion by the board and with the evidence that we have the minimum of eight students and we have that IRC or college credit. If you don't have enough students to move the program forward, I would ask that you approve a pause of the program for one calendar year. And hopefully the outreach that Juliana will do over the next year have enough students to run it in the future. So we need a motion to approve the pause for design and fabrication for one year and to inform the Agency of Education of our action. So moved. Okay. You make the motion? No, you were going to. Uh, I, well, I was up, going to and then I have a question. Okay, we'll make so the motion. I'll make the motion. Make the motion. Yeah. Yeah. Guy make makes the motion. the motion. Need a second? Second. Second, Jan, and now discussion. Guy, you have a question. So the question, Jody, is is the the Norwich affiliation no longer exist? So um, the previous instructor had the credentials. He was a, had a master's in art um, to be able to be a college professor, and our current um, instructor does not have the same level. And so we would we would need to see if they still are willing to to work with him in that, or if there's another instructor that they might ask us to bring in from time to time to just um, collaborate with him to do that. So right now, it's not an option. Not an option. It seems to be that that connection would would help in terms of recruitment, but maybe I'm wrong. You know. I don't Their know program is struggling also. They only had two students in it um, the first year. I think they've gauged up a little bit, but they are also struggling a little bit with that program. So that's something we could work on over the, this coming year? So yes. Jody, all of a sudden I'm like raising my hand. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Jody, I'm wondering what how receptive the art teachers are in within their program to really utilize you know the opportunity that they have before them and to see it as a way to introduce students to make a different choice or elect you know to participate in this work 
Yeah, so Julian no, no, and um, the director of the Granite Museum, Scott, had reached out to art teachers across our sending schools in the spring and invited them in. And a couple of them actually did come in um, and check out what students had done. And a few of them have been in because our students do have an exhibit there at the Granite Museum this summer. So a few have been in to check out that and have requested that Giuliano could work with them for a unit. And then we're hoping that when we does that, we can share that out on, on social media and with those with our other sending schools and that they'll also jump on board. I also know that um, the Spalding Work-Based Learning Coordinator, Michelle, has asked him to facilitate some stuff with her students. And so there's, there's just some little pockets that we're gonna try to keep growing. Great. Any further discussion? All those in favor of pausing the design and fabrication program for one year? In case aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Hearing none, that will be our action. We have approved pausing it for one year. And we'll, of course, work with it during the, the course of this coming year to see what else we can do to facilitate um, increasing the students in that program. The draft program of studies is in your packet, and it's really well done. Um, if you have not looked at it, I urge everybody to read it thoroughly because it, it is important, and it also uh, joins in with what we heard tonight from Pietro about having um, accountability, about having standards, and about being able to explain what goes on in each program. So I think it's really Yeah, it's also a really good example of our marketing, honestly. Like we put a lot into our presentation materials, so in our annual report and our program of studies, um, to make them look good because it's part of our marketing technique. It so, really talks to you. It really it really yeah, does. It really you know, is like a lot. Jump right out at you. Yeah. You know. So Jody, the one the one thing that Pietro talked about was uh, following up with some of our students to see what they're doing. And I don't know, I, I love how you have in here, uh, you know, salaries, potential salaries and jobs and whatnot. And maybe not for this one, but for next one, if we could put, you know, X percent of graduates got a job right out of high school or whatever, um, in each of those fields would be fantastic. To, we, we actually do have some of that data for six month placement. We're looking to build what we have beyond the six months because, you know, a lot can change for folks after they've been gone for a year or five years. Um, but that's a great idea and it's still in draft form. So we might be able to add that on some of this. Great. One big difference from this one and the previous ones is this one has prerequisites in it. Um, so we're hoping that helps give our sending schools language to talk with their students about whether this is an appropriate fit now or it might be later. Um, one of the things we talked about earlier, and we, we still do have a blind admissions process, and I don't want anyone to think that's changed, and that's not going to change because that's a requirement. It's after that we've accepted students and we start to look at what we're getting for students and what they might need to be successful, that we reach back out to Sunday schools and ask some questions. And it, I think it would be really helpful for our sending schools to really pay attention to what are those prerequisites, because those are the requirements to be successful in a program. You'll see some of those programs, the reading levels are can be a lot higher than we might expect for students who might be trying to access it. And so making sure that we either have the supports in place for the students that we're getting, or we figure out how to get kids ready which is part of what we're going to want to do with the foundation program in the future that we don't have yet. But building up the skills of our students so that they can access. Very good. Any further? Guy? So, yeah, just a you know, comment about the program of studies and you know, what we talked about tonight in terms of engaging and trying to recruit more students and stuff. My con it's not a concern, but the obvious piece is that if we're turning away X number of students. <laughs> you know, it's like, I guess I would ask the question, you know, to what end? What are you trying to do? You don't have room for them, you know? And it's like, 
and, and my other concern is that as students get turned down, you know how word get travels. You know, it's like I think it, it almost becomes a detriment to us in some respects, you know. Uh, so I just want to throw that comment out because it's just, uh, I mean, you know, you can recruit 200 more students, but where are you going to put them? Certainly on, certainly on the tip of everyone's brain to, to think about that yeah, because yeah. It, there's a huge push. And um, the Secretary of Education is doing her listening tour throughout schools. And I had the opportunity to sit in on, the, as she did her listening tour at the Barry Unified Union. And one of the concerns from the agency is they're looking at college and career connections that's a very important piece mm -hmm. and, and that's a very important piece for us to be part of that continuum so it, it's right out there yep okay um, future agenda items the board development and goal setting that we talked about in June um, placement in the workforce programs um, we'll have the um, co-op coordinator talk to us about that and program presentations throughout the year and certainly that was on the, the um, agenda for the um, program quality mm -hmm. people to make sure that we have continuity with our um, program presentations so that folks can um, know what we would like to hear about and they can provide that information. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the checklist we talked about. And exposure management plan. Exposure to what, Jody? <laughs> uh, this is something that's used in our health sciences programs, particularly in medical professions because of the phlebotomy piece yeah. where they do live draws. And so it's, it's, it's blood uh, borne pathogen exposure type of thesis. And the policy we have, um, Dr. Joslyn and, and Mr. Madison and really work hard on it and send it through visits lawyers and um, through visit for review and then we've been asked by several other CTEs to share that um, because it is basically the model policy for our state for CTE as far as those exposure like in case you get blood on you when you're drawing blood as a student okay all righty so we'll look at that in September and see what we think about it all right very good anything else any re reflections or summary or next steps we need to just keep moving forward we just need to know how we're going to proceed with the RAV so I have a comment about that actually I uh, texted I used my cell phone during the meeting please excuse me for that I texted Scott Farr, the River Valley uh, Tech Center superintendent who was on our board when we were going through the governance work um, and asked him if he had a regional advisory board and he said, no, his board serves that function. So with your permission, I'd like to ask the Agency of Education folks that are here at the conference um, what their perspective is on that. For yes. and, and just a suggestion while you're talking to them, because our governance board has both elected and appointed individuals from right. areas that could we as a governance board say that our for, for example but our our march and our august i don't know pick, pick two months but those two months we would be meeting as a rag instead of meeting as a governance board so, and whether or not that fulfills the, uh, the obligation, and then we could invite all the superintendents to, or their designees to those particular meetings and, and act as a RAB during, that per during those two meetings. That's an excellent um, suggestion, and, uh, and I think the November meeting would be the one I would recommend first for budget purposes. Thank you. Very good. All right, we'll carry up. So we'll we'll see how that we'll run that up the flagpole and see how it flies. All right. Anything else? All right. 
Then we need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Jenna? Jenna? <laughs> Anyone else? We need no second. second. Guy second. It's non discussion, and we consider ourselves adjourned at 7.50.